want to start a new sermon series today. Is that, would that be okay? Uh, we haven't done a sermon series for uh, several months now, but I, every once in a while the Lord just kind of downloads some things and like, oh, I think there's a theme developing here. And so there's a theme developing, and uh, it's called Overcoming Powerless Christianity. I just have a real uh, passion to see people move into the fullness of the gospel message. And as I look at my own life, I've had basically three seasons, I guess, of sort of spirituality uh, regarding God's power in my life. I, I grew up in the Lutheran church, which I'm very thankful, uh, thankful for in, in many ways of the things I learned there and learned the discipline of going to church every Sunday. And, and, and I just always kind of knew God existed and uh, you learned about Jesus and his death on the cross and his resurrection and learned the Ten Commandments and you just, you know, learned all that stuff. But I really didn't learn about the power of God, His supernatural power that's available to us every day. Not just in eternity, but today. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't know about that. And, and uh, since I didn't know about it, I didn't see a lot of it. Because sometimes you need to know something to see it, right? It's like my wife says, Nobody had a Ford Edge until I got a Ford Edge. Now I got a Ford Edge, everybody has a Ford Edge. I said, no, <laughs> there's been lots of Ford Edges. You just didn't see it until you got one, right? You ever, know that? you ever notice that? You buy a car and you don't, you don't think anybody had that car until you buy the car? Now everybody's got that car, right? <laughs> it's kind of like that in the, in, in the power, uh, with the power of God. You know, you, until you know about it, you don't see it. So, so I had this season of my life growing up um, and into, I guess, young adulthood, not even knowing about the power of Christ and, then, and not seeing it. But knowing Jesus as Savior, and that's great. Then I went into a season of my life that uh, was a, probably the longest season so far, so far, of where I knew I had theology, I knew of the power of God, but I didn't see a lot of it. Okay, I just didn't see it. A lot of it's because I didn't know how to experience. I didn't know how to tap into that, if you will. And so I spent a long, long time there. But, but more recently moved into a, a, a season of my life where I not only know about the supernatural power of God, I'm seeing it and experiencing it on a daily basis. And can I just tell you, out of the three, that, that what's going on now is the best? <laughs> I recommend that one. I recommend knowing about the power of God and experiencing it and seeing it. All right, But that doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. And so that's why I feel like this is a really important um, sermon series. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4.20, it says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. All right? There's a lot of talk in, in church, and there's a lot of talk about the kingdom, right? But, but where's the power? And that's what Paul's saying. Where is the power? Where's the power? And, and we should be seeing that, that power. Somebody got a phone call. Let's answer it. All right? You got it? Are we good? Okay, we're good. Or somebody reading the Bible to it. Maybe that's what it is. It's the, the Bible app reader. I'm like, am I hearing things? Anyway. Um, so we need to know that, that the kingdom is a matter of power not just talk. And so um, we're going to start uh, today talking about the power of awareness. Power of awareness. And you're like, well, what pow where's your power in awareness? I'm going to tell you, that's where we've got to start. Because if you're not aware of something, you don't know how to operate in it. Does that make sense? Everybody see The Wizard of Oz? I think everybody's seen The Wizard of Oz, right? You remember when the... the, the uh, House gets blown into the, I don't know, the kingdom of Oz. And she comes out of the house and she's holding Toto. Dorothy's holding Toto, right? Remember this? Look at that look on her face. <gasps> what she's saying? Toto, I have a feeling we're not in, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> Remember that? And, and that's kind of uh, our situation in Christianity. It's like we're not in Kansas anymore. Things have changed. Now, like when Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, which I love to hate that movie, right? 
like, he's like, you want, oh, the Wizard of Oz was like, kid, it's on. But then when those flying monkeys came, scared the daylights out of me. I hate the flying monkeys. But yet I could not watch. Maybe just one eye. Man, that was in black and white. We didn't even have it in color. That would have really freaked me out. But anyway, so, but I digress. So Dorothy, I mean, she's, like, she, she sees some familiar things, right? In the land of Oz. She's got Toto. She recognizes that. She's there and the house is there. And there's some, there's some familiar things, but things are different. And she's like getting this like, duh, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. And, and so she, she, she was becoming aware that things had shifted. Things have changed. And now how do I, and she's like, how do I operate in this? How do I get back home? What do I do? And she's, so she's got to try to figure out where are we? What's going on? It's the same way with the kingdom of heaven. We need, we need to know where we're at and what's going on and be aware of, of our situation so we know how to operate in that situation. And, and that's what we want to do through this sermon series is get you um, geared up to, to do that because um, if you're not aware of a situation, you won't know how to operate in it. And then we want you to know how to operate and how to experience the power of God. So we're going to talk about this power of awareness. And if you look at the dictionary, here's what the dictionary has to say about the power of awareness. Or the word awareness. It's, it's a noun, so it's a thing. right? Awareness is something you have. And it's having or showing realization, perception, or knowledge. It's like, oh, I perceive that. Or I know what's going on here. I realize what's going on here. right? That's awareness. And so the, as we talk about awareness, there's a few things we need to be aware of. This is like laying the foundation for the rest of what we're going to talk about in the rest of this series, overcoming powerless Christianities. We have to be aware, number one of this, that we have dual citizenship in the kingdom of God and in this world. So in a sense, we're kind of, we're here in Kansas, so to speak, right? I mean, we're in this natural world, but... The Bible also says there's a, there's a kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is here. Now, if you read the Gospels, and I hope you have, and I hope you will continue to, but especially like Matthew and Luke, but especially in Matthew, Jesus is going around everywhere saying, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is here. And I guess, you know, I read that for years but I got so ingrained, I got this, growing up we said the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. And then, you know, sometimes in between when times got tough. But, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I just thought that meant your kingdom is coming when he comes back. It is second coming and it will be like heaven and that will be great. So I, and I think like a lot of people, relegated this whole kingdom come mentality to a future time when Jesus comes back. Now when he does, he is coming back and there will be a perfection of his kingdom. But Jesus said when he was here 2,000 years ago, like, I brought the kingdom with me. Like, here you go. The kingdom is here. And, uh, he, and, and, and he had this to say about the kingdom in Luke 17, verses 20 and 21. It says, now when he, meaning Jesus, when Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in here. So is there a kingdom of God? Yes. Where is it geographically? Wherever you are. Wherever there's a true believer in Jesus Christ, there's the kingdom. It's within them. It's in them. It's just, it's true. I mean, it's not a geographic type of kingdom, but it is a true kingdom and it is here today because there are believers here today. And so when we talk about advancing the kingdom of heaven, we're talking about when people get saved and come to know Jesus, the kingdom comes within them and that expands the kingdom. Does that make sense? And so, um, so there's that sense of the kingdom. So we have to understand that there is a kingdom. It's not Kansas. All right? It's different. It's a supernatural spiritual kingdom that's just as real. In fact, it's more real because it's eternal than Kansas or anywhere else. It's a physical place. Um, 
And, and the Bible says actually our citizenship is there. Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we're, we're, it doesn't say you're going to be citizens of heaven when you die or when Jesus comes back. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say will be, does it? It says you are citizens of heaven. And so we currently are, we have dual citizenship. We're citizens of this world and we're, we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And so we have to understand that, that, that we got two things going on and, and when Jesus came back, it's not Kansas anymore because he brought the kingdom with him, ushered it in, and we have to understand that. So that's the first thing we have to understand. We're, we're, we have dual citizenship. The second thing we have to understand uh, regarding that kingdom is that God gave us power and authority in his kingdom. Little kingdom history. To be honest with you, when Jesus brought the kingdom with him, he was technically re-ushering it back in. The kingdom of heaven had been on earth. Man, in the Garden of Eden, had been a part of the kingdom of heaven. All right? Um, and in that kingdom of heaven, on earth, with the original man, Adam and Eve, um, there was power and authority given by God to man to rule and reign over the earth. Now, the earth and everything in it, the Bible says, belongs to God. Okay? It's God's. But he gave us power and authority on this earth. And he, he announces that early on in Genesis 1.28, like right in the first chapter of Genesis. Genesis 1.28 says, Then God blessed them, talking about Adam and Eve, mankind, and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So God's saying, govern over this earth, reign over it. Some of your translations say, uh, have dominion over it, right? Dominion is, is rulership. So right off the bat, God gave that to man. Now, God's sovereign, right, means he's all-powerful. But in his sovereignty, he's given power and authority to man, to us. He did originally on this earth to rule and reign on his earth. It's like he gave us the keys. So he, he made Adam and Eve, and he said, this is my earth, hope you enjoy it. Here's the keys, be careful, right? So they took the keys, didn't have them very long, and Satan comes along. And he says, hey, hey, come, look, come take a look at this. And he snookers them out of the keys. When Satan took the keys of the kingdom away from Adam and Eve, he snookered them out of it, the, the kingdom ceased to exist on this earth. So there was a kingdom of heaven, man was in control, had power and authority, but they gave their power and authority to Satan. And he had it for 4,000 and some years, from the time of creation to the time of Jesus Christ. Jesus came back to get the keys back. All right? Satan was in heaven. We know that, right? He was an angel in heaven. They called him Lucifer, meaning light bearer. And he had uh, lots of followers that followed him in his rebellion against God. And lots of people surmise about why, why, they, why Satan rebelled against God. And we don't know for sure why, but a lot of people think, because Satan was jealous of mankind. Satan was jealous of, of us because we have attributes that he does not have. There's, he has, um, we have, uh, we're made in the image of God. We're, we, we can procreate. I mean, they, those are things that they cannot do. And some people say that Satan was um, jealous of that. 
God could have stamped out Satan in a nanosecond. I mean, he could have just... But he didn't. We don't know why, but some people who think that Satan was jealous of us and that's why he rebelled against God also think that God decided to use man to defeat Satan. Could God have defeated him in a second? Of course. Done. But it's like, no, you know what? I'm going to use the very thing that he's jealous of to defeat him. And so Jesus came as a man, fully as a man, not only to die for our sins, which he did, but to defeat Satan. And gave us the same power and authority to continue to enforce that defeat. Okay, so, <laughs> so Jesus came back. And he's like, I'm back here to bring the kingdom. It's coming. And I'm going to give you the keys. But i got some work to do first. So he goes out in, in the desert, right, to start his ministry. Holy Spirit takes him out there. Who meets him out there? Satan. And Satan starts talking to him. And he says this in Luke 4, 6. It says, and he said to him, this is Satan saying to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor. Whose authority and splendor is he talking about? Ours, right? Because we had authority and splendor. We gave it to Satan in the Garden of Eden. He snuggled us out of the keys. I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. And then he goes on to say, if you just bow down and worship me, it's yours. If Jesus didn't do it, of course, he defeated him on the cross and through the resurrection. But a lot of people think, oh, Satan was just lying. He, he didn't have anything to give to Jesus. Oh, yes, he did. He had power and authority that was ours that we, we gave to him when we agreed with him to rebel against God. So he did have that. He's like, I got the keys, and I'll give them to you if you worship me. And Jesus is like, I ain't going to tell you what's going to happen because I'm going to get them anyway. We didn't tell him that, but that's, that was the plan. So when Jesus died and was resurrected, he defeated Satan. And, he, and so he knows, the res, he knows his death and resurrection is coming up. And so he goes to his disciples right before this happens, and he says this in Matthew 16, 19. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus couldn't give him the keys right then. Why? He didn't have them. He got the keys when he defeated Satan through his resurrection. See, Satan thought he won when he killed Jesus. But when Jesus rose again, it was like, whoops. Now Satan's the one saying, we're not in Kansas anymore. Things have changed. Now, Satan was defeated on the cross, uh, not on the cross, but on the cross, but when Jesus was resurrected, that's when he was really defeated. When Jesus overcame death. Now Jesus had the keys, right? And, he, and now he comes to his disciples, and now he says, I got the keys, I, got, I went and got them back. Don't lose them again. Be careful. Okay, so he... Jesus had regained our power and authority as a man. Now, he was God, fully God, but he set that aside, lived fully as a human, died as a human, got the keys back from Satan as a human, defeated Satan as a human, and gave us the same power and authority he had to defeat him, to defeat Satan. Same power and authority. He said, here's the keys. <laughs> I hadn't thought about this for a few years since I was in high school, but... You know, when we were in high school, um, the student council uh, kind of managed the concession stand for all the concessions at the games, right, and uh, the sporting events. And so occasionally, my friend and I, as part of our duties on the student council, would go to the inventory at the concession stand, you know, count all the candy bars and make sure there was change in there and do all that thing like on a Friday, you know, before the games or whatever. And so we'd have to hunt down a coach or a teacher, the principal usually, and say, hey, we got to get in the concession stand. And, and so he'd say, okay. And so we'd follow him down, and he'd take out his big old keys. You can tell who's important in the school with their, by their keys, right? Two most important people by, by the size of their keys, the principal and janitor, right? Because <laughs> they got the most keys. 
But we always have to find somebody, and then they take out their big thing of keys, and the, the real fancy one had like the spring thing that came out, you know, and they could just do that. Otherwise, I had to take them off, go through all the keys and open up, and they'd let us in, we'd do our thing, and then they'd shut the door and lock it, and we were done. So our senior year, we had a new principal. Uh, this was up in Fairfield. His name's Ward Fifield. Ever heard of Ward Fifield? It was, uh, I was a senior the first year he was a principal in Fairfield. And so we got to do our thing. It's like uh, we went to his office. Hey, we need to get to the concession stand. Got to do all that stuff. And he took off that big wad of keys, that huge thing, and he handed them to us. He goes, okay, just it, keys. You know, he showed us what key it was. And we walked out of there like, oh, oh. oh. And we, hardly, we could hardly talk to each other because like, oh, what are we going to do? What could we do? Oh, think of the possibilities. Because it wasn't just the key to the concession stand. It was the key to the whole, every, every lock in the school. Every lock in the school we had the key to. And we're like, we're walking all the way down there. Oh, oh. And guess what we did? We counted candy bars and did everything and locked it up. Because <laughs> when you have that responsibility, you start to think about it differently. Right? I mean, when, when, he, when he handed that to you, it's like, what he was saying is, I, I trust you. Like, make no mistake, this is my school, <laughs> but I'm giving you the keys because you got stuff to do. And so we had that authority to get in there. We had the power and authority to get in to that and, and do what we needed to do, but there were his keys, and it was, you know, his, his school, so to speak, right? But when, but when you have that and you see that, it's like, oh, we have a responsibility here. Do you see how there's power in awareness? I mean, when you're aware of the power and authority you have, there's like this, what are we going to do? What should we do? Well, how about we just do what we're supposed to do? <laughs> that would be good, right? And that's what we did. We're such good boys. Huh. But anyway, I can't believe I remember that because it was like six or seven years ago. And, um... talked about this before, but I think it's a good analogy. We talk about power and authority. We, we relate it to like a sheriff. Like a sheriff has a badge and a gun, right? And they, and they go together. The badge is his authority. That badge gives him authority to like use his gun. But without a gun, he has nothing to back up his authority with. And so, and so God gives you a badge and a gun. It's like, we don't need no stinking badges. Yes, you do. It's your authority that God gives you. You have, a, you have a badge and a gun, the power and the authority to do what he's called you to do. Now, in this county, our sheriff does not own this county, but he has power and authority in this county, right? And he, can, and he, he knows what his mandate is. He has power and authority to carry that out. It's the same, same with us. It's God's world. It's his world but, it's, but he gave us power and authority. We're like the sheriff. We got the badge and the gun, and we're supposed to, we have a mandate to bring the will of heaven to earth. But we don't always do that because we don't, we're not aware that that's our mandate. We're not aware that we're not in Kansas anymore. We get so focused into living our life in this natural realm, and we forget that we're dual citizens. We forget, oh, I have the kingdom within me, I want to advance the kingdom. I have power and authority to do that. And I should be using that power and authority to advance the kingdom of heaven. Which brings us to the next point about this idea of the power of awareness is that we have to make the kingdom our priority. It needs to be a priority. Jesus said this in Matthew 6.33. He says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. how much do we seek the kingdom above all else? I think for a lot of us, it'd be more accurate to say, we seek this natural world, we seek a good life in Kansas, and we add a few kingdom things when it fits. <laughs> but that's not what the Bible says, right? The Bible says, seek his kingdom first, and everything else will fall into place. Now, it's not, it's not a lazy resignation. What I'm saying is, if, if you seek the kingdom of God first, if you seek what he has, he will lead you and guide you 
not only in the supernatural, but in the natural. He'll give you strategies. He'll give you ideas. He'll, he'll give you ways to do things that he wants you to, how he wants you to live in Kansas as well as in his kingdom. I think as Christians, a lot of times we, we think that things start in the, here in the natural and we cry out to God in heaven, oh God, do something. And then he hears us in the supernatural, then he does something. But that's not, that's not what the Bible says, how that's supposed to work. The Bible says it starts in the supernatural first. Right? And then the supernatural affects the natural. Because remember when we read, uh, go back to verse Matthew 16, 19. When he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That's actually not a very good translation from the original language of Greek that the New Testament was written in. There's a, there's a, a Bible translation called, out there called the Holman Christian Standard. It's an okay translation. I use it once in a while. They got it right. But what, the, what it really says in the Greek, it would be worded something like this. Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. So we're to bring the will. It fits perfectly with the, the Lord's Prayer, right? On earth as it is in heaven. Where does it start first? Heaven. So we're to, we're, we're to bring the will of heaven to earth, and we have the power and authority to do that. See, we think we use our power and authority to cry out from the earth, from the natural, from Kansas, cry out to heaven, cry out to the kingdom, the kingdom wakes up, does something about it, and back here. No, it all starts there first. Right? But we have to be aware of that. And so we're, we're to bring the will of heaven to earth. And we have that power and authority. I mean, so many times as Christians, we cry out to God, God, why aren't you doing something? And if we were to really listen, he'd probably be saying something like, why aren't you? How come this isn't happening? I don't know. Why isn't it? Because a lot of times he's given us the power and authority to do what needs to be done, but we're not doing it. Am I making any sense? <laughs> Hang with me for a minute here. Because when I said this in Fairfield, I got a lot of furrowed brows. But I had to explain my way. I had to explain this through. So hang with me for a minute. Too many people blame too many things on the sovereignty of God. Is God sovereign? Absolutely. It means he's all powerful. The earth is his and he can do whatever he wants. But you know what he's wanted to do? Whether you agree with it or not, or whether you're even aware of it or not, but here's what he's what he decided to do in his sovereignty is give you power and authority. Like, well, that's kind of dangerous. Yeah, did you ever give your keys to your new car to your high, to your high school kid? Of course you did. I mean, some of you haven't, but, right? Is it risky giving keys to your, of the car to your kid? But at some point you trust them, right? And you, and you hope they live up to that. You hope they, they earn that responsibility and are responsible, right? And, and God doesn't, it's not just hope. But he's entrusted with that. He's entrusted you with something that's important. And, and a lot of times when things don't happen, it's because we're not walking in our power and authority because we, we think we're still in Kansas. And we're sitting there in Kansas waiting for God to do something. And he's waiting for us to do something. I don't know who said this. Uh, it's some great theologian who I can't remember now. But he said, uh, he said something like to the fact like, uh, without God, we can't. But without us, he won't. And there's a lot of truth in that. Can he do whatever he wants? Absolutely. Why doesn't he? Because he's given us power and authority. And he wants, he wants man to do that. And, he, and, and we need to realize that so we'll step out and advance the kingdom of heaven here on earth. But it's got to be a priority. It can't be something you add to your life. Do you understand that? This church thing is not something you add to your life like 4-H. Although some people live for 4-H. But I mean, that is their world. But, but you know what I'm saying? I, I'm not making fun of 4-H. It's a great thing. You, but you understand what I'm saying? It's not Lions Club, or, which is another great organization. They do great things. But Christianity isn't something you add to your life. It's... It's where you live. It's who you are. You are a citizen of that. 
And you need to operate in that and understand the power and authority you have and then use that power and authority to advance the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Are you aware of that? Good. Because you need to be aware of that for, for anything else to make sense. So this had to be the foundation of this whole sermon series of overcoming powerless Christianity because if we don't understand that we've been given power and authority and there's an expectation for us to carry that out, nothing else really makes sense. And I think that's why so many of us go through our Christian life like trying to make sense out of it because we never got the foundational thing from Genesis 1. I've given you authority. And then when it's restated back in Matthew, when Jesus came, came to this earth, Matthew 16, 19, I, I give you the keys to the kingdom. You have a responsibility. They're powerful. These will get you into places you never thought you could get into before. And these can lock things up that need to have been locked up a long time ago. And these can let things loose that need to be let loose a long time ago. They've already been bound in heaven that need to be bound. They've already been loosed in heaven, which needs to be loosed. Now go do it. All righty then. Can you do that? All right. Worship team, let's come on up as we close this morning. I guess, to, you know, to be honest, I think there's a part of us I don't know, there's a part of me, a, part, a little part of me, that's like, I don't know if I want power and authority. <laughs> I just like to just hang out. <laughs> I like to see God do everything. I like to just sit on my behind and hit the remote and have him do whatever he does. Right? And sometimes we get that sort of mentality with God. Like, well, let's just sit on our behind and rub the, rub the genie and see what pops out. Right? But, <laughs> I mean, and God will do things for you when you ask, but there's things he's asked us to do and take power and authority. And so as we go on in this series, we're going to be talking about, okay, how do we do that? How do we experience that? But today you need to know you have that power and authority. And that's why this is going to be a series because like, well, how, how do I walk that out? Well, then come back to the next few Sundays and we'll talk about that, okay? All right, why don't you stand as we close this morning in prayer? Father God, you are an awesome God. You are an awesome Father. And just like a good dad, you give us responsibility. You're not the, the dad that won't let us do anything. You're the dad that expects us to grow up and take some power and authority. And we know that, God, we're not you. We're not God. You are God. We're your kids. You've given us power and authority in the name of Jesus to bring the will of heaven to earth. Lord, that's not a responsibility we take lightly. We're awed by that responsibility. We're honored by that responsibility. We, can, we count it as a privilege. But Lord, we want to take it seriously. We want to be about your business, Lord. We want to advance your kingdom here on earth. Lord, help us to make that a priority. Help us to wake up every morning knowing, being aware that we are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And as a citizen, we have power and authority to bring the will of heaven to earth every hour of every day. We're not just citizens of this world. We're citizens of heaven, of the kingdom of God. Lord, I ask for your kingdom to be advanced in this community, in this county, in this state, all over the world, Lord, more and more. People would be coming to you, choosing you as Lord and Savior, adding to the kingdom daily. And people walking in your authority and power that you give us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That we can change this world. Lord, we just pray that you would empower us to walk in that power and authority. Show us what to do. Give us strategy. Show us, show us what it looks like in heaven so we can, we can speak it here on earth. We can loose things that need to be loosed and bind things that need to be bound. We trust in you, Lord. 
count it an honor and a privilege to work with you. We receive the responsibility you give us in awe and respect and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.